Yes. Thank you, Eva. Um, my presentation, maybe I should say something about myself. My name is Thomas Pritzko. I come from the European Commission. And as such, probably, um, and I want to give uh, the EU perspective on things, the EU policy perspective on things. And uh, sometimes that feels as if we come from the far end of the longest distance from Brussels. But uh, I will try to, uh, to bridge that distance in my presentation of EU policies on teachers and teacher education. Um, my own function at the uh, European Commission, I, I work at the D Director General for Education and Culture in the, uh, in the unit that deals with uh, school education and the Erasmus Plus program, as it is now, previous, the, previously the uh, Comenius program for school education. And I'm one of the coordinators of the working group on schools policy that looks into sharing policy practice between member states in this particular field uh, as it happened over the next two years. And we've already heard that we've been doing so together with the member states already for a number of years. This is also all excellently summarized in the background report that you received for, for this conference, uh, meaning the beginnings of European level cooperation on teacher education. And I will not go back into history you can all look that up in the, in the background report, and most of you are probably much more familiar even than I am with what happened. Just one remark, uh, when Michael Schratz talked about uh, mobility and the low levels of mobility uh, among student teachers, well, this is particularly how it started at a European level with the Lingua and the later Comenius programs, which allowed student teachers to be mobile. But uh, we're all aware that we're far from universal mobility in, in this field. Um, I will try to give you an overview of the EU's role, especially the Commission's role in this context as facilitator, as policy facilitator, and also through uh, the funding programs that, of course, EDITA is uh, a beneficiary of. Now the Erasmus Plus program, uh, we have other programs, you mentioned Horizon 2020 and the European Social Fund in this context. But I particularly want to give you an overview of the ACQUI the European Aki in teacher education. I said I won't go back, but uh, assuming that we've built over the last couple of years increasingly on a sort of uh, Aki and a knowledge base that we now try to deepen even further. So uh, the idea is that what you should take away from this is uh, um, what there, what, what, what's happening uh, at European level in terms of policy development and uh, I want to throw in a couple of uh, um, pieces of latest evidence. Let me start with something that uh, is uh, hot off the press. June 2014, I don't know whether anyone has come across this Eurobarometer opinion survey. So a representative sample of Europeans was asked um, which are the most important aspects of education and the context of this was the uh, consultation on the European area for skill, skills and qualifications. So there's a particular background to these questions, but this is still a fairly generic question, gives us an idea what people think. Um, so they were asked, they were given a number of choices. That's of course debatable, but uh, they're mostly in classroom and uh, uh, some, uh, some choices linked to teaching practice. And the point that I want to make here is that, no, I went too far. Um, that something that we know from research already that uh, even from this uh, opinion survey, the teacher emerges as one of the strongest factor also in public perception affecting student outcomes. In this, in this case, it's phrased as the most important aspects. If you look at that, the ability to engage and motivate students, two out of three people said that was the most important aspect of education. Expertise as subject knowledge, one in two, named that as the most important. And then we have the ability to ensure orderly learning environments as uh, it's still one in four people. Um, as said, the other choices given were um, linked to learning environments, uh, for instance, inducing creativity and curiosity of students, but also organization of learning, practical work experience, and so on. So here we have a strong recognition by the public that the teacher is crucial. The follow-on question was, um, where do you see uh, room for improvement in your own country? So this was specifically linked to the country context of those people. 
asked. And we can still see the teacher is uh, still right up there, but it's, um, if you compare figures, still one in two things that uh, need for improvement uh, in the field of the ability to engage and motivate students. And uh, expertise or subject knowledge, we have still one in three. So here's a, here's a double message, I think, of the teacher is crucial, but there's also a constant um, uh, expectation uh, that there is room for improvement. If we now ask the teachers themselves, uh, you're probably all aware of the TALIS survey, the OECD's Teaching and Learning International Survey, that has just been published, the first results of which have been published uh, only last week. This was a major survey that was first conducted in 2008, and now we have the, the second round of this survey, where teachers and school leaders were asked about working condition, job satisfaction, feeling of self-efficacy, so trust, uh, teachers' trust in their own um, abilities, and very importantly, their education, how that prepared them for their job, continuous professional development. Um, I've just picked out two of the messages that we have um, picked out as the, uh, as the European Commission. We have summarized the, uh, the findings of the TALIS survey from an EU-specific perspective, because there are 19 member states that are um, covered by the TALIS survey this time, so a, a critical mass of countries, and we've tried to come up with, um, uh, to link that with the policy recommendations at European level. So one of the most shocking messages was the, uh, the level to which teachers think that their profession is valued in society. That's less than uh, one, in, one in five, 19% of EU teachers think that their profession is valued in society. If you link that, with we, which we just saw from the Eurobarometer, uh, we have a clear, a, a clear um, a worrying trend of outside perception of the teaching profession. Um, at the same time, we have to say that the uh, teachers asked in the survey said they're on average very satisfied with their jobs and that they wouldn't reconsider um, that they would still go into teaching. So that is quite uh, reassuring. The same, uh, the same patterns have emerged from other studies that we have conducted. Another strong message was uh, the one about teacher shortages. If you think about the uh, overall um, notion of declining attractiveness of the teaching profession, um, here we had a, a question to school leaders. Um, can you say that, um, that teacher shortages hinder effective instruction at your school? And the question, it was phrased in a sort of amalgamated way. Um, it was asked as a shortage of qualified or well, and or well-performing teachers. So that is fairly much left to the, uh, to the perception of the school leader here. Um, and uh, in the EU, 36% uh, of teachers that um, work at schools where there is such a shortage. Now, the, the issue of teacher shortage is a complex one that might be, uh, that doesn't affect all countries, as you know. We have uh, around a third of our member states who, who have global shortages of teachers. We have others where there are um, big shortages of, in specific subjects. We have gender imbalances. So there is a lot that is linked to this. There were also a lot of specific messages about teacher education in particular which is, of course, an important aspect of the attractiveness of the profession, opportunities for continued professional development, for instance. So we have learned, we can learn a lot from this survey about uh, where there are needs for more professional development, such as ICT and teaching learners with special needs, multilingual, multicultural settings, and so on. Um, we have data on induction, for instance. We see that induction programs are still far from universal in European countries. Of course, there's much more in the TALIS survey, and, and, and we, we're, um, we're following um, on with, with, with secondary analysis on what we can learn uh, from this survey. If we look now at what the consensus on teacher education is at a political level, uh, as recent as May of this year, we had uh, EU education ministers uh, adopting council conclusions on teacher education. As you know, the status of council conclusions cannot be compared with European, uh, let's say, hard European law in the sense of directives and regulations. We're, of course, in a subsidiarity context where we have, at most, recommendations or typically council conclusions. 
Now, what this conclusion said, the provision of high quality initial teacher education, early career support, and continuous professional development, so we have the whole continuum there of teacher education, is a significant factor in ensuring that suitable candidates are attracted into the teaching profession and that teachers possess and maintain the relevant competences they require to be effective in today's classrooms. So we have a twin task there for policymakers to uh, address the situation of shortages and the decline of attractiveness of the profession, to attract suitable candidates in sufficient numbers, and secondly, to ensure that uh, teacher education across the whole continuum uh, from initial to continued professional development makes sure that teachers are equipped for the job. Um, we have today's classrooms, you could say 21st century skills is such a buzzword. Um, so we have a strong political consensus there that we need to look at the entire spectrum of teacher education and uh, that this is an important part of uh, getting uh, the right people into teaching and equipping them well for this job in order to allow everyone to excel in teaching. I should say at this point, of course, teacher education is also for us not an end in itself. It is always the educational success, the achievement of pupils and learners that is the eventual, the eventual goal. So um, the long distance to the pupils' minds, we remind ourselves ever so often that that is the eventual goal. Now, just as a, as, as, as a recap in what kind of European EU context we operate here, EU countries are, according to the principle of subsidiarity, of course, in charge of the organization and the content of their education systems, um, but they increasingly recognize that there are common challenges. I mention again, for instance, the attractiveness of the teacher, teaching profession, shortages, uh, levels, competence levels of teachers, the, uh, the, uh, the necessity to define teacher competences, and so on and so forth. Um, so what's the, what's the role for the EU then in this field? This is, of course, one as facilitator, as a, as a broker between member states to assist member states. And uh, the uh, European Commission, as the executive organ um, of, the, of the European Union, has a twin function there that I already uh, mentioned. First of all, uh, we support policy cooperation at EU level. Um, this involves, for instance, uh, expert level working groups that I mentioned before. So a tradition, and actually it goes furthest back in the field of teacher education, where we're now in the third or even fourth generation of working group uh, looking into this area. And this also just brings home the fact that, there's such, uh, that this, this is such a rich and complex field um, where over the years we've been looking at different aspects of either uh, continuous professional development or mobility or teaching practice. Now the, um, the latest generation of working group is um, the one launched at the beginning of this year and I see some members of the group also in the room. Um, this current working group on schools looks into teacher education and as one of their focus areas. The other one is early school leaving. In terms of teacher education, this group looks into policy practice, successful policy practice, hopefully, in member states that uh, helps make initial teacher education more effective and ensure its quality. And the principle of peer learning and peer review as it were, um, is based on the idea that member states can learn from each other, they can act as critical friends towards, towards each other. So we'll be working over the uh, next, well, the remaining one and a half years, not even, uh, on finding common policy issues um, for all member states and also on finding specific, specific assistance to, uh, to particular countries that can learn from others. We'll be looking uh, later this year into, for instance, the governance of initial teacher education. And that, that doesn't mean institutional governance. Here we look at uh, the perspective of policymakers. What can they, what can countries learn here from each other in terms of steering, monitoring, evaluating um, initial teacher education to ensure um, 
it delivers the outcomes that society expects and that the labor market expects and so on. And we're again with um, learners, learners' achievements and educational outcomes. Then, um, so I mentioned peer learning and peer review. We also try to uh, bring in different levels of decision making as the commission. For instance, we've revived the bi biannual meetings of director generals for schools. This means we try not only to learn lessons at expert level, but also feed this up in to, to a higher level. Uh, these are high ranking civil servants from the member states that have a sort of a role of steer of our working groups. And then there's of course uh, the, the council that uh, on a regular basis has addressed this issue of teacher education over the last year, also school leadership and uh, other issues such as investment in education. The other important task of the European Commission is of course the management of funding programs, support programs such as uh, the Erasmus program that was part of the lifelong learning program just like Comenius, the field I worked more on, which, uh, which was the school education program with opportunities for staff development and, and partnerships between schools, but also at, uh, at a, uh, a larger scale, we had multi, multilateral projects and networks in Comenius, for instance, as well. You might be familiar with this, producing teacher education courses that then individual teachers could um, uh, participate in. I mentioned also, well, I should say now, this is all part of the Erasmus Plus program for the next seven years. And uh, I should also mention the structural funds at this moment for a lot of countries, uh, European Social Fund uh, um, funding is essential in the field of teacher education. Now, how is this field of teacher education embedded in what else we do in terms of school policy as the Commission? I just projected here the basic fields that are linked to learner competences, to equity, and then we have the teaching professions as a, a cross-cutting theme. Um, when Michael said that uh, uh, editors should also uh, help us stimulate uh, crossing boundaries and breaking down conventional barriers, I was thinking of the way we organize our policy work at the Commission. So maybe there will be also a stimulus coming out of EDITIV for us uh, transgressing these uh, uh, typical, uh, typical um, uh, policy fields um, because we see that uh, as a team working on these uh, every day that everything is connected and linked whether you take early school leaving, early, early childhood education and care with early investment that then pays off later um, literacy, math, science and technology, the basic skills, this is all linked of course to the teaching professions. Now um, as the next part of my presentation I would like to, I, I promise to uh, summarize the, the key or the, the policy messages that we have been uh, formulating and all this um, was summarized two years ago, one and a half years ago in a paper linked to the Rethinking Education Initiative. Um, the paper that specifically deals with the teaching professions is called Supporting the Teaching Professions for Better Learning Outcomes. And uh, this is a summary of the state of play of all the work that the Commission has been facilitating between member states. So it's, these are the lessons from peer learning over the uh, last couple of years in addition with research, some of which conducted by the Commission itself, some of which based on Eurostat data or on Eurydice, the EU network on, on education information. And uh, this paper then makes 10 key recommendations for policy, uh, for policy makers. It also gives the Commission a bit of homework, but um, I would like to take you in the coming couple of minutes to take through these recommendations that we have been making in this, in this paper. Um, there are five actions for teachers, three for school leaders and two for teacher educators. We stress that uh, the teaching professions for us means more than teachers and the staff teaching itself. It's very important 
we keep saying that school leaders are not forgotten and neither are teacher educators and we've seen that recently um, teacher educators have been put on the political agenda much more than they used to be before. Um, the profile uh, and the competences of teacher educators are increasingly in the focus. Um, but to start with teachers, the one message is to define the competences that teachers require and at this moment I would like to come back to the council conclusions of May um, because this is the maybe not the first time but the first time that has been explicitly mentioned uh, by education ministers so there's a consensus that uh, competence frameworks or standards can help uh, steer uh, education policy in many ways um, there is a need to define teachers competences uh, for many reasons and this will this will not just help uh, design curricula for initial teacher education it will also help policymakers inform the um, uh, the choices they make in terms of the provision of continued professional development it uh, it will help in selection and recruitment procedures so however that is done is then a matter of course for a country to uh, to decide for themselves um, there are different ways what what would he say um, is that it's important to make this a broad consensus and to involve uh, all the relevant stakeholders, um, meaning the um, higher education institutions or the schools, well, depending on the context, the providers of initial teacher education, but also teachers, schools, um, or even wider parents uh, and, and other stakeholders in this definition of competences. So the the most important is that there's a broad consensus and as a basis for them acting upon this. Um, in, in the council conclusions there, it says there is a need for this uh, and ministers then invite each other to explore uh, the possibility of using such competence frameworks. We've seen that depending on how you define it, uh, at least half of EU countries have already such competence frameworks in, in place then the question is, of course, in the detail, how far do they go? Redesign systems of recruitment and selection to select the best candidates into teaching. So um, we've conducted peer learning on, on this particular uh, very interesting issue to see what kind of practice uh, exists in different member states. The situation is very different. There, of course, there are very few countries that uh, still manage to attract the best candidates, the best graduates, if you like, um, the most suitable candidates into teaching. I think uh, Scotland and Ireland among them. Um, but uh, many countries struggle. Um, we had, for instance, the case of the Netherlands, as our, our peer learning activity was based in the Netherlands, who said, well, we can't, we have shortages and, and uh, uh, teacher shortages and we can't really select the best because we have to take those that apply. So this is also a context that policymakers have to live with. Um, the question is there, how can we redesign the system to, in order to get the best possible candidates? Maybe it's not just the best graduates uh, from secondary education. Of course not. So. Um, the next point, um, induction, early career support, I've already mentioned that the TALIS uh, data, which again I have to say is of course um, perception based data, but which is backed by other surveys that uh, we have conducted says that um, early career support for beginning teachers, which is so crucial in the first couple of years especially, is still not universal in European countries. Um, we see that this kind of induction is very good for commitment and also I come back to TALIS because it's also uh, fresh data that we have uh, that shows how uh, taking part in induction also um, instills then commitment to, to take part in professional learning later, uh, to take on mentoring roles, um, for instance. Uh, the fourth point, review in-service learning, career-long collaborative professional learning, so known as CPD. The, um, 
The main message is here that we have, have, have understood from international surveys and from our own research that, um, that many teachers think that they don't get the right or don't get enough uh, opportunities for professional development. They quote, they re refer to uh, boundaries such as uh, conflict with work schedule, that they don't have the right incentives to engage in in-service training. Um, so here's an invitation to member states to work on these um, incentives, link them, for instance, to career progression, to new tasks and responsibilities, um, to make uh, um, teachers, well, not understand, they probably understand that, most of them, but uh, give them um, the opportunity also to become career-long learners, to update their competences throughout their careers, because we know that initial teacher education, of course, cannot provide them with all the competences they require. There's always the question of resources and in, 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 uh, in times of budgetary constraints in many countries, policymakers will face the question of where to put the money. Um, here are some messages about um, uh, finding the right modes of delivery and the right forms of uh, CPD that are not necessarily uh, passive learning formats away from school. It can be very well uh, collaborative uh, learning that is based at school. Of course, this must, not, this must be well framed and the impact must be proven because otherwise it could, of course, be an excuse for saying, um, oh, we do, do it at school, that's much cheaper. And um, no, these uh, opportunities must also be balanced with, uh, with other opportunities that some member states already offer. For instance, uh, for teachers to... Uh, Take, take a sabbatical and, and in, enroll for a master or even a PhD program um, like this one that we hopefully have in the, in the very near future. Um, the last point on teachers is the one on feedback and appraisal. Um, regular feedback is a part of a professional work environment, that's clear, but it happens far too little uh, in many countries. It is also in the Council conclusions um, that this, is, this should be part of a teacher's work environment. But um, what is important here is, of course, that uh, appraisal and feedback is, is based on transparent and fair criteria, especially if appraisal is then linked to career progression. And maybe more important, so it must be constructive, it must be formative to allow teachers to become the self-reflective practitioners. Um, and needless to repeat that this, is, um, this can be then also linked, it should be based on a clear definition of what teachers need to, what kind of competences they need. If we look at school leaders, there are some recommendations that have been made. Um, let school leaders focus on learning. Um, we have known from Eurydice, but this has been uh, recently confirmed also by Thales, the sheer amount that many school leaders have to dedicate to administrative work um, that then takes time away from that so crucial uh, task of developing a pedagogical vision for the school, of uh, uh, developing teaching and learning at their school, of that should be linked to a, to a development plan and be uh, linked to, as I said, a long-term vision um, that then clashes with the reality of administrative chores that often uh, are on the shoulders of one individual. Um, so here's also an invitation to uh, think about modes of distributed leadership at school, which then in turn can also be a way of giving teachers uh, uh, an additional career incentive to take on leadership uh, roles at school. The second one is reinforced recruitment and retention of school leaders. Uh, make sure you get the right people. On what basis do you recruit school leaders for this very specific task? It is not just a progression. I mean, that's what we probably all agree on. Uh, you're a teacher, then you're a school leader. There are specific tasks, competences linked to that, and that also means that, um, that there should be professional development paths with Induction, just as for teachers, there should be inductions for school leaders and uh, clear opportunities for professional development for those that are 
us to fulfill that role. Lastly, teacher educators. As said, it's fairly recent on the EU policy agenda, um, but we had uh, um, the outcome of peer learning that is in, in this paper and also in a dedicated policy handbook on teacher educators that came out of the, um, the working group. Uh, dealt specifically with teacher educators and their profile. There was under Irish presidency, there was a, a, a presidency conference about that topic. And one of the biggest challenges here is that um, teacher educators in many countries are a sort of strange beast or an undefined uh, or a, a poorly defined profession that would really profit uh, in terms of its uh, professional status from a, a clearer definition. So again, the, um, there's agreement now at European level that um, competence-based criteria for school leaders would also, uh, for, sorry, for teacher educators would also be helpful uh, in this regard. And the second one was reinforced collaboration between teacher educators. Since it is such a, often such a diverse and heterogeneous group in many different settings, not just at uh, universities and teacher training colleges, but also in some countries, school-based teacher educators, in the private sector and so on. Um, this profession would profit a lot from uh, better networking um, between themselves. Um, now, these were a, a lot of, well, I should not say the Ten Commandments, but I think for the round figure of ten, this was made... Uh, 10, you might ask, where is initial teacher education? Um, that was maybe for the sake of the number 10, but initial teacher education is in everything else. I think you've, you've noticed that um, while I was talking about these recommendations. Now, these were recommendations to the member states, but of course uh, we can't take ourselves out of the equation. What does the EU do? Um, what was the follow-up of uh, this catalogue of recommendations? Well, the... Um, one of the, uh, the biggest projects that we've just uh, successfully, I would say, that was just launched is the Erasmus Plus program. As you know, the uh, funding programs and instruments are tied to the seven-year budget phase. So over the last couple of years, the Commission has been busy together with uh, national partners um, preparing this program that was then um, adopted late last year by Parliament and the Council. Erasmus Plus now covers all education sectors and uh, brings together um, seven or eight different funding uh, programs, be it the lifelong learning programs with Erasmus and Comenius, be it Erasmus Mundus, Youth in Action and so on, under one uh, roof in one uh, coherent funding instrument. And you will all have heard that the good news was that there's, an increase, that there's a substantial increase in budget. Um, if you follow the, um, the negotiations for the multi-annual budget of the EU, that uh, was, of course, not necessarily to be expected. But uh, here we have a recognition that education is considered as part of the solution in Europe. I should also say, in the terms of the policy uh, process, the other not rev big revolution, but an uh, important evolution for us was that Education is now considered as part of the central uh, EU reform agenda, the Europe 2020 strategy. Um, their headline targets, they happen to be early school leaving and the number of uh, university graduates, which are proxies for uh, a lot of other things that uh, um, happen at, at, uh, in, in European level cooperation on education. But it shows that uh, it's, it's now recognized that, that education and training are part of part of the solution. Um, I mentioned already the new working group on schools, so um, we'll be looking at quality and effectiveness of initial teacher education, but uh, the second focus area is uh, uh, early, how to fight early school leaving and in particular collaborative uh, learning environments at school and the entire group will look into this. This is of course also important for teacher education. I again, sorry, I quote Talis, that again showed us how important collaborative um, learning um, is because it's linked and associated with so many positive factors of teachers' job satisfaction and, and the impact of professional learning. And um, lastly, I should mention the um, uh, 
number of studies. Uh, we've just published a study on the attractiveness of the teaching profession, which wanted to look into strategies that EU countries and European countries have to uh, increase the attractiveness of teaching. Turned out there are not so many strategies, so it looked into um, what there is. And um, I invite you to uh, look at that study. If you haven't done so, you'll find it on the um, commissions on the Europa website. Uh, we're currently also conducting a study on innovative pedagogies. Um, here we're looking into a specific example of how these innovative pedagogies can, can help uh, address low achievement in basic skills. Uh, I should say, again, we're interested in policies uh, at this level. Something I should, uh, I forgot about Erasmus Mundus, uh, something that was in the catalogue of uh, homework for the Commission. Um, collaboration between teachers at a European level, uh, that is probably the strength of this programme, and um, that is why the Commission is beefing up the e-twinning community of schools. I don't know, is everyone aware of e-twinning? Who has never heard of e-twinning? Everyone has heard of e-twinning before. Um, e-twinning will be developed. It's, it's, of course, a community for teachers only so far and other school staff, but this autumn we will launch a school education gateway. That's the name of the project that will then allow us to bring in, uh, to make this, to extend the dialogue on this platform to education stakeholders. E-twinning will stay and remain a safe environment for teachers and their pupils, but we see that uh, European level collaboration, um, that such a platform would, would, would uh, definitely um, pay off uh, and, and allow us to go further than uh, what we do, for instance, through our expert level groups. I think this is what I wanted to say, and um, I hope that I've given you an overview of what happens at EU level. Um, some of the latest evidence has said we will we continue to be looking into um, into what we've just learned from Thales, and we have a number of studies coming up. We have the working group um, on initial teacher education that will come with conclusions next year. So um, we will never run out of work in that field, and uh, I'll hope you'll have the occasion to follow it as well. Thank you.